Good afternoon, and welcome to today's webinar, Google for Education, New Caney Independent School District Embarks on One-to-One -one with Chromebooks, sponsored by Google. Today's speakers are Jamie Newworth and Dustin Hardin. Jamie is a Regional Program Manager for Google Education and concentrates specifically on Google Apps for EDU, YouTube for Schools, Chromebooks, and Android tablets. He is focused on growing Google's presence in education by building a growing user interest and is striving to drive education technology in creative and unique ways. Previously, Jamie was a classroom teacher in Arkansas and was most recently at Kennedy Incorporated, a cloud-based ERP company. He graduated from Johns Hopkins University and was a varsity water polo player and a member of the 2008 Division III National Championship team. Dustin has been working at New Caney ISD as the Director of Technology for the last three years and in education since 2003. He has extensive experience with one-to-one -one programs, networking, infrastructure architecture, and strategic planning for all technology areas. He is a 2004 graduate from Barbers Hill ISD and has a Bachelor of Science from University of Houston Clear Lake. Before I pass things off, I'd like to mention two quick things. If at any time during the presentation you have questions, please post them in the Q&A panel on the lower right-hand side of your screen. Also, please be on the lookout for a follow-up email with a copy of the slides and a link to the archive to review and share with colleagues. If you have any questions which do not get answered today, please contact Jamie and Dustin directly via email, and you can reach Jamie at J Newworth. that's J N E W. N-E-U-W-I-R-T-H at Google.com, and Dustin's email address is dharden, that's D-H-A-R-D-I-N, at newcaneyisd.org. Now I'd like to hand things over to Jamie. Great. Thanks a lot, and uh, really excited to be here. Jamie Newworth here with Google going to just go through a couple slides. Uh, have some uh, some interesting things to share in regards to Google Education's uh, uh, offering to schools, including our platform, as well as um, kind of our mission behind the open technology uh, to improve learning. That idea, as well as uh, then we'll hear from Dustin at New Caney and uh, follow up with some some quick questions and answering. So. Get started here with this idea of 60%. Here in the Google Education team, we think about this number a lot, but what is 60%? 60%, we like to say, is the percentage of students currently in school today whose future careers do not exist yet. If you think about it, many of the tech roles that you and I didn't have when we were in school. When I was a student, there was no Google for Education account managers, there was no Google for Education Chromebooks, and there wasn't even any type of tablet. This isn't true just for tech roles. Many non-tech roles have changed dramatically as well, generally as a result of the adoption of technology. The way we research, collaborate, disseminate information has already evolved and will continue to change. So conventional thinking on education is no longer enough and needs to change as well. We need to teach our kids the tools to be successful, how to collaborate, research, organize information, formulate an argument, etc. In many ways, technology has already transformed the way we communicate, participate, and experience in the world today. Technology removes barriers. When I was growing up, and I think this uh, tr holds true for a lot of us, if we wanted to do research, we had to go to the library. In many instances, the entry in the encyclopedia was our only source of information. Once we finished the article, that was it. But technology has opened up new worlds of information for today's students. We have the ability to explore and learn more deeply. Real briefly on these slides, the first slide up top shows one of our Google schools, Fort Sam Houston in Texas, that serves a very heavily military population. They choose to use Google Apps and Chromebooks because it allowed the parents to stay connected to their students even when they were deployed overseas. Uh, the second picture uh, in the right is how technology also allows other stakeholders to be involved in education. Uh, that top right picture shows how you can use Google Hangouts to bring experts into the classroom. For instance, you could bring a local political figure or business leader to speak about government or economics in class, as well as a surgeon to talk about biology. That third picture, you might recognize the painting 
uh, from the image, it's George Surratt's A Sunday on La Grande Jatte, which is typically ha housed in the Chicago Institute of Art. Like most of our students, I haven't been to the Art Institute in Chicago and have never seen the painting in person, but now we all can get there much easier. Google has taken high-resolution photos of many paintings as part of our Google Art Project, so now we're all able to zoom in on the painting and study the details that led to the pointillism movement. Similarly, on the bottom right, we don't all have the luxury of traveling to the Galapagos to learn about sea turtles, but we can all open up in Chrome on any device and travel with map tracks to explore and learn about these islands and other places around the world. So open technology. So what can we say and what can we do to help transform education? Google's mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. Here on the Google and Education team, we believe that open technology is the key to improving education. So what does it mean for a school to go Google? We asked our Google schools and they told us it's, more, it's about more than just the technology. It's about adopting a culture that extends beyond the classroom walls. It's about openness, curiosity, and working together. Going Google in education means four things. The first, empowerment, helping students to discover a world of infinite resources. The second, choice, being able to use the right device anytime, anywhere. And three, teamwork, having students, teachers, and parents able to work together in real time. And of course, the fourth, scalability, bringing in technology that is affordable for everyone and easy to manage. We'll take a quick couple of minutes to talk about each of these. First, empowerment. When you have access to digital content, it empowers students to give teachers the tools for individualized learning. It's important to help students to discover that worlds of infinite resources and changing the role of the teacher from a lecturer who disseminates information to a facilitator who coaches and supports students as they explore the informa information accessible to them to solve real-world problems. Second, Google believes in giving schools choices, the ability to use the right device anytime, anywhere. Because what's good, what, what good information, uh, what, what good is information if it isn't accessible in the classroom? Teachers can only change the way they teach if students have reliable access to a device. So we want teachers and students to use the right device, whether it be a laptop, tablet, phone, or desktop, and to be able to use that device in school, at home, or on the go. We think that a student's information and learning environment should be easy to access and secure, whether they're using a laptop, a tablet, or a desktop in the classroom, at a library, or at home. Basically, we want the technology to get out of the way so students and teachers can focus on content and on working together. With that in mind, Google's solution works on many platforms, so schools can use their existing equipment and keep their options open e even as they commit to new device deployments. Next, going Google is about teamwork. Teachers say that being able to work together in real time using Google Apps is the most profound change in the way they teach and the way students learn. Collaboration fosters teamwork, problem solving, and organization, key skills for the modern world. So how can, we take, how can you take collaboration to the next level, real time across the world, anytime, anywhere? One way is with Google Docs, where multiple students can work together in the same document at the same time. This makes school work more like real work. Students can learn more by working with a set of classmates with diverse perspectives, as well as when they learn how to uh, do group work together. Who is the leader? Who is the editor? Who has the right to change that work? These discussions are the same kind they'll be having at university as well as in the professional world. Now right here, this slide unfortunately isn't animating, but it, it shows that you can use Google Docs and have different people editing multiple uh, lines, multiple documents on two different devices at the exact time, all in real time. Finally, going Google is about scale, having technology that is affordable and easy to manage. With a school's budget, the price of a device matters, as low-cost as low cost solutions give more students an opportunity to go Google. But scale building, device, and content management are equally important to keep total cost of ownership low and to allow IT teams to manage the surge in device deployments. Google makes devices that are quick and easy to set up and manage. With Google Apps as the foundation, it's easy to manage 10 or 10,000 devices with your admin tools. You can set up a whole classroom of our tablets or our Chromebooks in just minutes. Because devices are intuitive to use, the students get started with them quickly. No need to run around to do troubleshooting in every classroom. And with our 24-7, 365 online and phone support, we can help out if there are any challenges. This is the sort of offering that means that you can easily scale your IT. 
Next, we'll discuss what Google uh, Education has to offer. Technology can help transform the classroom, but let's not forget that real change requires people, and people need help to change. Google makes this transition easy by making the technology feel invisible and out of the way. We do this by making it simple and secure, by making it seamless across all platforms, the core platform, the device to access that platform, as well as the content you access through those devices. Obviously, we think this approach sets us apart from competitors that focus on just one or two of these key elements, leaving you to deal with the gap. So how can you start to go Google? First, the platform. Firstly, we offer schools a free suite of services called Google Apps for Education. These apps include Gmail as your email service provider, productivity tools like docs, spreadsheets, and presentations for content creation. Since Google Apps for Education are all web-based, it means that they are available from any device with a web browser. They are also great for collaborating because multiple people can be creating and editing at the same time. Google Apps uh, is incredibly popular with schools. There are over 30 million Google Apps for Education users found in 180 different countries, as well as 74 of the top 100 United States universities have already gone Google for Education, including seven out of the eight Ivies. And on a national scale, like I said a moment ago, there are over 180 countries that have already gone Google, and I'll highlight one in just a moment. We also have Google Classroom, new to the Google Apps suite, which uh, allows teachers to uh, be more organized with their students and their docs and collaborate really well. Uh, really what it does is weaves together the docs, Drive, and Gmail to help teachers create and organize assessments quickly, provide feedback more efficiently, and communicate with their class with ease. So we like to say it's less teching and more teaching. And not all Google Apps, uh, and not only are Google Apps a powerful, transformative platform for schools, the price is right. They're 100% 100 free for school districts without ads. Now let's look at devices. We are excited to say that we have many choices for devices uh, for schools. With several Chromebooks and the new Nexus 7 tablets with Google Play for Education, going one-to-one -one has become easier than ever. Chromebooks are web-based computers that are great for schools because they're easy to use, manage, customize, and scale. With Chromebooks, students open the lid, sign in, and you're up and running in under eight seconds. This allows your teacher to de dedicate more of the valuable time towards instructions. When using Chromebooks, everything is stored on the web, so it doesn't matter which machine you use. When your students sign into any Chromebook, they're taken to the learning experience that you have designed for them based on their curriculum goals. The idea is for the technology to seem invisible in the classroom. It's just another tool. Chromebooks are great because they are shareable and incredibly simple to use for both students and faculty, and Chromebook adopters say that they love the devices because they simply just work. We're now offering a wide range of Chromebook laptop devices, Samsung, Acer, Lenovo ThinkPad, HP, Dell as well, and more on the way. The hardware specs of each of these devices are a little different. They vary in terms of screen size, ports, weight, etc. but all of them are running the Chrome operating system, and all of them have managed to the, are managed to the Google Apps for Education account by using a Chromebook management license. So despite the difference in hardware, the user experience and management experience will be the same across devices. Let's talk briefly a little bit more about the management experience because this is, it is one of the critical differences with Chromebooks compared to other devices. Chromebooks are incredibly easy to manage. If you are in tech or if, uh, if you talk with your tech department, you know that managing devices takes up a significant portion of the time. Buying licenses, installing software locally, setting up antivirus controls, continually checking to make sure everything is updated and running correctly, wiping, re-imaging devices periodically, all of these things are very time consuming as well as cost intensive. Since the Chrome devices are entirely web-based, it makes management a breeze. Chromebooks shift the model from the old way of managing where you have to touch, uh, touch each and every device. With Chromebooks, you can manage all your devices through one centralized web page. Here, you're able to control devices' settings, sec security settings on all your computers. For instance, you can require your students through, uh, you can require that your students through the proxy, regardless of where they're signed into Chromebook, you can specify you can use your devices, potentially locking it down so your students and faculty can only use the devices. You can also easily push web-based applications out to the students in just a few clicks. All the controls of the Chromebook Management Console enable you to create a secure testing environment which are great for Park, Smarter Balance, and soon-to-be other testing services. 
Chromebooks also have multi layers of security built into the devices, including sandboxes and verified boot. In order to use the management console, you need to purchase a one time license, something that we can discuss a little bit further at the end if there are any questions. With Chromebooks as well, the primary source of content is Chrome Web Apps. These are web-based applications that run in the Chrome browser and Google provides a wealth of online applications throughout the store. There are thousands of applications that span all different subject matter and grade levels, and these are all web-based that can be used on Chromebooks and on the Chrome browser even if you're not on a Chrome OS device. If you have already, uh, if you have already uh, recommended visiting the Chrome Web Store in your Chromebook, or if you are on a different operating system, install the Chrome browser and visit the Web Store from there. From the admin console, you can also install apps for the Chrome Apps Pack, which are collections of popular applications categorized by elementary, middle, and high school. Most of these apps are free, and paid apps offer a bulk discount. I wanted to mention quickly as well that in April 2013, the whole country of Malaysia announced they were going Google. They deployed Google Apps for 11 million teachers, students, and over 100,000 Chromebooks nationwide for primary and secondary students. Another example of the ability to manage the device and the platform at scale. We also help schools go Google through tablet devices. Last fall, we expanded our device operating to include tablets with Google Play for Education. The program is open to all K-12 districts in the United States. Our team worked with schools to ensure that the solution of devices, content, and management was truly designed for learning and made for the classroom. We designed the program to make it easy for schools to deploy the devices, discover strong educational content for the teachers and students, and deliver those apps, videos, and books to the right users. There are two components to tablets with the Google Play for Education, the hardware and the licenses for each device. Real quick, the hardware piece. Like the Chromebooks, we want to give schools a choice, but make sure that all the devices are affordable, durable, and easy to scale. At this point, there is one Google Play for Education approved tablet, the Nexus 7, uh, as well as uh, an HP device, and we have more coming out in the very, very near future. Whatever device you choose, you will need the second piece, the license for Google Play for Education uh, for each device to make it easy to get your tablets up and running and managed very simply. Like managing traditional laptops, setting up and managing tablets can be painfully manual. IT departments often have to configure devices with school policies and setting one by one, so rolling out devices can take days, if not weeks. Once the tablets are in class, even app installations can require approval before content is downloaded onto the tablet. With Google Play for Education, we fix this. We streamline the process so that setting up a classroom's worth of tablets takes minutes, not days. The Google Play license gives you the access to provision applications that lets you set up devices by bumping two tablets together. I've personally seen a, a group of 30 to 40 uh, tablets, I think it was about 37, be bumped and set up for an entire classroom in about six minutes. So it's something that we're really excited about here. Having a device is not enough though. Schools also need strong educational content to use and easy ways to find it. There are over a million apps in the Google Play Store. With your license, you can also gain access uh, to the Play for Education site that enables you to search for apps that are customized by curriculum goal, state uh, testing goal, as well as by uh, different uh, age groups. The Google Play for Education site makes it easy for teachers to get the right content to the right students quickly and efficiently. Similarly, in the past, schools have needed to run all content management through a central office. This can slow things down and make it hard for classrooms to get the digital resources they need in a timely manner. Google Play for EDU makes life easier by giving teachers the control and flexibility they need. We've made app sharing easier in an instance when the content has a cost associated with it, associated with it we've made paying for it easier as well. Teachers can now purchase in bulk purchase orders uh, for different devices that are set up, of course, internally, instead of having to go one by one with their credit card. But none of this would matter without great digital content. The Google Play for Education, we've created a content store just for schools, giving you access to a huge variety of K-12 content and tools you need to help find the perfect material for any lesson. 
Within the Google Play for Education site, it's easy to find the right app for the job because you're able to filter based on subject, grade level, classroom activity, state standard, and more. Once you find an app that looks interesting, you can uh, read detailed app descriptions, reviews from Google Play to get a sense of whether it works well, and every application that's on the Google Play for Education is vetted by teachers. If you're looking for reading material, you can choose from thousands of K-12 books as well. We've worked with, all, uh, with, worked with major publishers to make huge selections of titles available for rental at affordable prices. So instead of buying a classroom set of books that class for three years from now that might not be interested in, teachers can customize their reading materials to their students' interests. In addition to the book rentals, we also have access to thousands of classic books that are available 100% free. It's nice to know Shakespeare is never more than a couple clicks away. Finally, and before I pass it on to Dustin, thousands of YouTube EDU videos are also available in the Google Play for Education Store. YouTube videos are great for the bite-sized lessons that communicate concepts in a fun and engaging way. The videos teachers find and share from Google Play for Education appear in a dedicated playlist that can be different for each student. Like books, this video playlist is available from any web browser. It's a great way to share educational videos at school without worrying about the whole wide world of YouTube. And that's from, uh, this is Jamie from Google. I want to say thank you very much. I'm now going to pass it over to Dustin. Jamie, thank you so much. Uh, I also want to thank Google and uh, eSchool News for allowing me to do this today. Uh, I'm Dustin Harden from New Caney ISD. Basically, my presentation today, I'm going to give some brief overview of where, where we were at New Caney and kind of how we got to this one-to-one. -one. New Caney, we're, we're really nothing special. Our free and reduced lunch is at 60%, which is so it, we're kind of in the mid-range, if you will, as far as school districts go. Um, what kind of sets us apart, I, I believe, is the fact that we did all this without going out to bond. And that's where a lot of school districts are now. So I really want to try to move through these slides, kind of go through the background, and then really open up for question and answer <clears throat> because really every school district is in such different areas. Some of you are trying to figure out how to do the infrastructure side. Some are trying to figure out how to afford it. Some are trying to figure out just how to tie that curriculum piece into a one-to-one. -one. So New Caney ISD is about 45 minutes north of Houston, Texas. We have 13,000 or, or about to have 13,000 kids and uh, 14 schools. And even though we have this great one-to-one -one that we're pushing out with Chromebooks, we have all these Nexus tablets that we're purchasing, New Caney wasn't always in the best condition. So in summer of 2011, I was actually hired on at New Caney, which was less than three years ago. Every single school, all 14 schools, had no Wi-Fi. They had just finished building one elementary school, and that new, brand new elementary school had no Wi-Fi in it. The network was in complete disarray. Um, one little network loop on an elementary school would take the entire district down, not phones, Internet, 911, everything, just from one small loop in a teacher's classroom, everything would go down. We were using a legacy email system that if you looked at the server wrong, it would fail. Um, no, nobody could attach your phones to it because they had some problems with some spam. So they turned off IMAP and POP, so really no one was using uh, the legacy system because it wasn't a uh, very good form of communication if it was never working. There was one person in the Instructional Technology Department for all 14 campuses, and even though she is wonderful, she's still on staff today, we just got promoted to a new position, one person for about 800 teachers just wasn't cutting it for that professional development. The students didn't have logins. Every student would walk up to a Windows computer uh, that had Novell on it still, log in with the username of student with no password, log in, and be, they're automatically an administrator over that computer. I'm sure people are giggling on their side because everybody's gone through that. But again, this was only three years ago. I think the bigger problems overall is that there was limited vision and direction with the technology department. They were just kind of buying things at random, allowing the campuses to buy anything they wanted to. And there was not a direction of what they wanted to do. And the saddest part was there was no alignment with curriculum. Uh, kind of ties back to the no Wi-Fi problem. Curriculum had this great idea to buy all of the principals and assistant principals iPads to do uh, their teacher evaluations on so they can do it you know, paperless. What a wonderful idea. 
So after purchasing those iPads, they got to the campus, and because there was no alignment, no communication between curriculum and technology, there was no Wi-Fi for those iPads. So all that technology was, all that money was just spent on technology that couldn't be used. So that's where we were less than three years ago. We did make a lot of very fast progress. Uh, summer of 2012, we did a whole new network core, installed over 800 uh, access points in every single uh, school, or every single, uh, 800 in every single school, that would be a little ridiculous, 800 for the entire district. About one, ex uh, one access point per classroom is what we tried to touch on. Uh, we didn't know at the time we were going to go one-to-one, uh, -one, but we wanted to prepare for whatever we were going to go to, whether it be bring your own device, carts. I didn't want to worry about uh, infrastructure in the future. So the network is two years old, and yet we're still able to push out a very good one-to-one -one next year, which I'm very excited about. In the spring of 2013, we actually made the uh, change from the legacy system we had, which was group-wise, to Gmail um, for all, all of our teachers, all of our faculty, all of our staff. At the same time, we purchased Google Vault for our uh, to uh, retain, retain all of our emails, uh, very inexpensive. It uh, served a great purpose. It's cloud-based. There's no additional servers, very low overhead. Um, it was I had done a group-wise to exchange conversion before, and I'll say, I'll tell everybody this, that a group-wise to Gmail conversion was a hundred times simpler because there was less training for those teachers and faculty members since nine times out of ten, they had their own Gmail or Outlook account. They already had that idea of how a web email worked. So it was a very easy conversion, very simple. Uh, Google helped us along the way, any questions that we had, and things worked out very well. In that following summer of 2013, um, we were able to purchase a very nice laptop for every single teacher. The teachers were using desktops that were sometimes up to eight years old. We were asking them to do their basic job duties of integrating technology, but without mobility, without even a desktop that would say running half the time, they really couldn't do their job. We ended up actually doing a fair market value lease on those laptops, and I'll touch on that here in a little bit because that really paved the way for us to be able to afford new technologies doing leases. Finance wasn't really excited about it, but after seeing the amount of money that we're saving with doing a fair market value lease, it made a lot of sense. And at the same time, we finally got all of our students uh, account for the first time on the network and for Gmail. We used a third-party program um, that now instead of having one network administrator take on uh, the 1,600 uh, staff accounts, he was now able to handle about 15,000 uh, accounts with a third-party application. So a very powerful program that we got. So after all that was said and done, we were at a point uh, this past uh, school year as we're starting up that the teachers were good, our network was good, our infrastructure is good. The students yet had really yet to be uh, accounted for for any sort of technology or any technology in the classroom. While all that's going on, our curriculum department had started doing project-based learning trainings. That was a very really key factor to doing this one-to-one -one because at the time, in August of 2013, we still didn't know we were going to do the one-to-one. -one. This has all happened very, very quickly. Um, whenever we got back from the summer, Teachers were begging for more and more technology because of that one-to-one. -one. Um, at that point in time, I was tasked by the superintendent to go figure out what we wanted to do for the school district for our students. At that, this is really a, it looks kind of like a funny slide, but this is a, a, a very important slide that I would let everybody see and let everybody kind of t take in for a second. Because this is this is the method I used to get into one one approved. You can use this for almost anything. Curriculum really wasn't real. They weren't on board with the one to one completely. They thought we couldn't afford it. They didn't think anybody wanted it, and they just wanted to buy a lot of iPads beyond anything else. So what I did first is that I went and spoke with every single principal, and I asked them the question: If I was a parent and walked into your school, what would need to be in a classroom? for that parent to go, wow, New Caney ISD, they're really on top of their game with technology. And all 14 principals had different answers, but they all were kind of coming back to the same thing, which was just more. They wanted more technology. The secondaries eventually came to the conclusion that a one-to-one -one would be in a beautiful environment. But, of course, that was just in a dream world because we couldn't afford it. 
but I still had all that information of what the principals really thought their campus would need to put us on a different level. After meeting with all the principals and gaining all that information, I then went to curriculum instruction with, hey, all your principals are kind of on board now with the exact same idea that we need more technology and here are some ideas on how to do it. Curriculum and instruction, they were so excited that their principals were on board with this idea that we decided to then immediately go to the superintendent. The superintendent said, get more numbers together, get what we're going to do, and then we'll go to the board. Before I went to, went to the board, the most important thing I probably did to decide to go with the Chromebook, I, I actually didn't make the decision on the Chromebook. I put that on the students. I went to both, one, both of our high schools and let them decide, met with leadership groups uh, and said, hey, if we were to give you something, what would you need to increase your learning, whether that be a tablet, a laptop, what is it? And they over overwhelmingly came back with, we want a keyboard. Without a keyboard, we can't really do our work. So that immediately you know, got all the tablets out. Asking some more questions and diving into some more information, we all kind of came to the conclusion that with New Caney, with our demographics, as Jamie was talking about earlier, our students were not really prepared with technology. Some of the students even said they wouldn't go to the lab for the entire year unless they you know, happened to be in a computer class. Some of the teachers just wouldn't even have the time or the resources to go take their students to a computer lab. So our students were graduating with very little technology exposure. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter what device we picked. We needed a device that got, got, gave these students access to the internet and gave them the ability to learn concepts. I had a lot of people talk to me about, well, what about Word and Excel? The concepts you learn from Google Apps will go directly over to Word and Excel, and that's what our students came to the conclusion of as well, that it's not, it's not exactly what, it, what Word and Excel and PowerPoint are, but the concepts are the same, and it's better for them to be exposed to that than nothing. So that was kind of where the students came from. Most of the decisions that I made, including my policies, I put on the students. I would go talk to them because by the time I went and met with the board, they asked me, where did this come from? I said, actually, the students came up with it. Very rarely will the board or superintendent or curriculum tell you no if it's a student's idea because for the board, some of their own children were uh, the ones making the decisions. So the biggest question is, how do we afford this? It wasn't the simplest thing in the world. We actually ended up taking money from my usual computer replacement funds, that the state money we had from instructional materials allotments, for those of you in Texas who know what that is, or the, the textbook funds that we got from the state, and we actually got approval from the federal uh, people to use Title I funds. Got a nice letter saying that we're, because the project wouldn't have been possible for the third through fifth grade without the title funds, they allowed us to use it. And I, I really can't talk that much on title funds. I just know enough to get me in trouble. But uh, the person who wrote it, uh, the email and crafted all that information to the feds uh, did a wonderful job. And without that, a lot of this wouldn't have been possible. All that money added together only accounted for about a third of the full money we needed for what we wanted to do. That's whenever I was talking about earlier, the fair market value lease, how important that was. Doing that, we were able to actually break it up into three different payments over a three-year period. After the three years, we send the Chromebooks back to whatever company we got the uh, lease through. People sometimes think, well, it means you don't own the product. How, you know, that, that's not that great if you don't own it. However, after three years with a cell phone, you're ready to throw it out the window anyways because it's going so slow. After three years with the Chromebook, I, I know for a fact there'll be something newer out that is not going to be a Chromebook most likely. It might be it might be similar. The Chromebooks only existed, um, what, two years ago now? And that was that one Samsung. Now, you know, look how much they've exploded. After three years with one piece of technology, it's time for something new, whether it be an updated Chromebook, some sort of new device that where you see the tablets and the Chromebooks come together with the Play Store for Education, and there's no telling. But three years of any device is just, that's time for it. So this is basically coming out of funds that we know for the most part are going to be there. So now we have a sustainable system and not just bond money that we purchased one bulk uh, 
device, bulk of devices with and trying to figure out three, four, five years down the road, how do we uh, replace them? Now this is money that pretty much every year is guaranteed that we're going to be able to move forward with this uh, project. So that's very exciting to know that in the future we'll be okay. So after we found the money, because the, de because the device we decided on was the Chromebook, we were able to now do a lot more uh, than just the high schools and middle schools, which was our original idea. Now we're able to go uh, pre-K and kindergarten for every single classroom gets four of the Nexus tablets and four of the Chromebooks. Those teachers came to us and said a one-to-one -one really wouldn't work because by the time uh, they go around and have to log all the little ones in, their little ones are already distracted. So four of each uh, device, now they can have stations set up and it's much easier to manage for them in the classroom. First and second grade wanted six Nexus tablets per classroom, but they still needed some Chromebooks for different type of testing. So we actually got a Chromebook cart for each one of those grade levels for every single campus. So with nine elementary schools, we ended up buying 18 uh, Chromebook carts. Um, they actually came to us with a very interesting use case, so we went ahead and went with the Nexus tablets for them as well. So it's been very exciting to see how that's going to work next year. And starting in third grade, uh, is when the one-to-one -one starts. Third through fifth grade, the students will have their own device, but they're not going to go home with it. We actually bought some uh, cabinet charging systems to place in every single classroom where the 10-year-old computer set anyways. We're removing all those, the giant CRT monitors. Um, so we're able to put that charging station there. And as soon as uh, the class rosters are released in August, we're going to go give them that amount of students, that amount of Chromebooks for any students they have. And then starting 6 through 12, every single student will have their own Chromebook to go home with. That's the decision that was made um, that uh, kind of allowed us to, again, because of the cost of all of this being much lower than some devices, we were able to go all the way down to third grade and even a lot of devices for the pre-K um, through second. So with, the, of course, a one-to-one, -one, it's in the one-to-one -one handbook, if you will, you need to come up with a new policy. The policy we came up with was a $30 usage fee for uh, parents um, that also includes an insurance fee. This covers theft and one accidental break. Um, we're actually using a third-party insurance company this first year uh, to help us with this. They cover theft if, as long as there's a police report and cover accidental breaks throughout that uh, year. I'm very curious to know how that's going to work. Um, as you all know, with one-to-ones, it's kind of a hit and miss of with how that the breaks happen and what's going to happen with that, how available parts are going to be. So that's going to be very interesting. We also put in a scaled accidental damage fee uh, so that after that first accidental one that's covered by the $30, uh, after that it starts, I think, at $20 or $30, then moves its way up, eventually being the cost of the repair if they break it so many times. If they start breaking it that many times, it becomes more of a, <clears throat> more of a discipline issue than a, a Chromebook or a break problem. So there's just some extra things we we did as well to prepare for this. While going to the board, I went ahead and uh, added some more technicians to the staff just because with a one-to-one, -one, even though these are Chromebooks, the kids are going to probably take care of them, they're still going to get broke. So we still needed to have some additional staff uh, put on there. So I hired a couple extra and a couple extra technicians for next year. We also hired this summer eight interns to help us with the deployment. Also, when the students turn the devices in at the end of the year, uh, before they go out for summer, I'll hire some more interns next year to kind of do our own refurbishing. So just it's as simple as uh, opening up the Chromebook, wiping it with disinfectant, and um, doing a um, basically a refresh of the system as much as we possibly can. Very inexpensive, well, a whole lot cheaper. Of course, CDWG and uh, the other companies out there wouldn't let me wouldn't let me saying this. That's a lot cheaper than buying that white glove uh, system. Of course, it's more overhead on your part. You have to kind of manage them, but you get some high school kids, some college kids that graduated from your high schools. It also goes really far with uh, the board and the press knowing that you're using your own students to do this. We also converted the librarians to media specialists um, so that we would have that additional training on campus. Uh, that wasn't the easiest move in the world. That's not something fun to do, to be very honest with you. However, it, it's a much needed uh, thing that both the principals and board both agreed that without the training that they have throughout the year from those people, the system, this one-to-one -one was most likely going to fail. So that's something that we had to do. Again, not, it's not a fun thing to 
uh, work through, but it's definitely something that's going to make a lot of improvements next year. We did have to get a new inventory system. Uh, we just weren't prepared for that much of many devices. We have our own inventory printer now, so that that's very exciting. The fact we're able to print our own labels and everything is very inexpensive, the one that we went with. And one thing we actually just picked up, picked up was a, a program called Go Guardian. Um, you may have sent some emails about it. Uh, whenever we did our parent meetings, the biggest concerns were obviously theft and um, browsing at home for filtering. Well, at the time, we didn't have anything for filtering at home because really there wasn't a lot out there unless you turn the proxy around. Now, USAC, for E-rate reasons, says that you don't necessarily have to uh, block at home, but obviously your parents are going to want that. Go Guardian costs about three fifty dollars advice for a year and handles anti-theft with geolocations, key logging, screenshots, those sort of things, um, handles the uh, ability to do browser history, how many, what documents the kids are editing, what videos they're watching, what Google searches they're doing, and does also some uh, blacklisted categories that are built in for you to make those SIPA compliant as well. Now, the, the piece that I really liked about it with a one-to-one -one especially is the fact that I can go in and see how many students are currently logged on per organizational unit. So if I had any additional, if I had any campuses that were complaining or not performing up to their par as the other campuses, I can go on and now see if they're actually utilizing the devices as much as the other uh, campuses are. One of the things that people always ask is, okay, you do a one-to-one, -one, where is the data that shows it is actually improving education? Without having the data to show that they're actually using them, it's very difficult to say that's, that's the reason that um, that school in particular is doing better on test scores, graduation rate, et cetera, et cetera. So that was a very important feature that I would like, that I liked, and that's the reason I went with them. And as I said, it's very inexpensive, covers a lot of things that, uh, that parents were asking for. So just some future concerns and plans that we have that we've been kind of kicking around. Obviously bandwidth being one of the biggest. Right now I'm sitting at about 300 megs of bandwidth for my district, and it's because of the guest network and uh, the kids love to look at YouTube. YouTube's probably more than half of my traffic to begin with. I know it's going to increase going from just having a guest network to giving every single one of these kids a device. So we're going to probably look at over a gig uh, next year of bandwidth, which is terrifying for one. Um, and for another, I'm trying to figure out which device uh, is going to be the bottleneck. I think it's going to end up being my firewall if I had to just point out something, but that's probably going to be the bottleneck at first. And obviously, once the students go home with the Chromebooks, how, do, how are we going to be able to serve those students the same? Uh, as soon as the students get the device, one of the surveys we're going to have them do is as simple as put in your student ID and do you have internet, yes or no? From that, I'm then going to send it over to the Information Systems Department to pull up the addresses of the ones who said no, see if we can get any sort of mappings of where those students are having problems with Internet access. I've already been talking to Comcast and CenturyLink, AT&T, companies like that about these are the different um, areas that uh, we're going to have problems with. So they're prepared and they know that we're going to have some problems next year, and they're excited about it as well. So they're going to have additional customers. And also, we're going to start doing some advertising of, uh, you know, for the free and reduced lunch kids, Comcast does have a, a lower rate um, that's there. That they don't sometimes like to advertise. We're going to do that as much as we can. One thing that I'm kind of excited and looking forward to is trying to get rid of all the computers in the district, one of those being the computer labs for K3, you talk about your uh, AutoCAD, CS6, Microsoft Office. So starting next year, we're going to really look at some different uh, fundings that we can maybe pull on a VDI solution so the students would then walk in with their Chromebook, hook it up HDMI to a giant monitor, mouse, keyboard, and additional charger that's there on the desk, and then basically turn that Chromebook into a thin client to remote into a VDI solution. Um, how that looks, how much that costs, if it's even going to work, I don't even know yet, but it sounds like a really cool idea that I can't wait to try. And earlier I mentioned about the fact that we're using an insurance company this year um, for year one. Next year, after we start collecting that $30 fee, we're going to take a look at that insurance policy versus how much would we have spent versus all the break hooks from all the data that we have and see if we can become a self-insured uh, district. So that's an overview of what we're doing. I try to do it as quickly as possible. Um, and again, the, the big thing that I, I like about this is now, if you have any questions at all, 
don't hesitate. Um, even if it's just as simple as which Chromebook you went with. I'm not sure if Google likes me talking about that, but we did do extensive research and even our own uh, ruggedized testing, if you will, to make sure we picked the best one. All the way to uh, you know which uh, which access points do we use? How did how we doing uh, stuff on the wireless, et cetera, et cetera. So with that, I'm going to turn things back over, um, and I guess we'll do question and answer now. All right. Thank you very much, Jamie and Dustin, for that informative presentation. Uh, we have time for several questions from the audience, and the first question is directed to Jamie. Jamie, uh, what is the difference between Google Apps and Google Apps for Education? Hey, thanks so much for that question, and it's a really good one because uh, there is absolutely no difference except the price, and that's something that we come up against, uh, come up against uh, a good amount because it does seem like, well, it's free. There's got to be something in there. It, there's honestly not. What we we've decided, and and there's a quote um, that that Sergey uh, Brin, one of our founders, likes to say, is that. You know, Google was born uh, as a research uh, paper at Stanford University when him, uh, he and Larry Page, the other founder and now CEO, uh, uh, were research partners and that this is their way, one of their ways of giving back to the world as well as to the world of education. So Google Apps, the, what a company or a corporate organization would purchase Google Apps, whether it's email, uh, uh, calendar services, Drive, all of those features are the exact same um, with Google Apps for Education. So the only difference is that it's 100% free for K through 12 and university, uh, uh, college universities here. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the next question is for Dustin. Dustin, um, it sounds like your funds for technology used to be very low. Did you get all the funds by financing instead of buying, or were there other ways you got enough funding to do this into technology? Um, the funding was, it's kind of interesting, so that it wasn't that we didn't have a lot of funding. Uh, the funds were just used, being misused, if you will. The campuses were making a lot of very poor decisions on what they wanted to buy, so we tried to pull as much and centralize as much funds as we possibly could. I was able to increase some of the funds, um, especially for the wireless and uh, wired side. Having said that, it wouldn't be impossible to be able to do a financing or a leasing uh, for uh, those, especially when we look at the infrastructure side of things. You, instead of doing a three-year lease, you can potentially do a five- to six-year financing since a lot of the equipment that you might be purchasing is going to last that long anyways. I would also suggest um, talking to your finance team and there's, your funds team has some resources that they don't even know about sometimes. Whoever's in charge of your, the bonds, usually you have a third-party company that comes in and helps your finance team with bonds for the school. They can actually uh, do some very interesting things because it's one of the concerns was for us, are these fair market value leases affecting our bond rating? And the answer to that was no because we're not going to be paying taxes on these because Dell still technically owns them. Um, so I would definitely investigate if there's any sort of problems for funding and definitely investigate all sorts of finances and leases that you possibly can and really touch, really talk to your finance department and reach out to them and any sort of resources they have. Okay. Thank you for that. And the next question is for Jamie. If a school starts with Google Apps for all students, can this be transferred to Google Classroom easily? Yes, it can. Now, I'm a little unclear of the exact question, but if you're running Google Apps right now, uh, Google Apps for EDU for just uh, students and you want to get teachers on board as well, uh, that, that is the way to have a Classroom be set up between them. If you're running Google Apps for everyone, Classroom will, will, will be showing up very shortly um, um, in your Google Drive, and, and there's a lot of ways to extend out the um, uh, extend out the domain with Google Apps if you are running a dual delivery system with something else for staff to extend the Google Apps so that classroom can be um, set up between students and teachers. I, I hope that answers the question. If it does not, um, uh, again, I'll have my email. Um, will, will be set again at the end as well as on the, uh, the email that will be sent out to everyone if you have further questions. Thank you for that, Jamie. Uh, Dustin, the next question is for you. 
Um, how useful are Chromebooks for students when they take them home if those students do not have access uh, to the Internet? We, had, we actually did a very small pilot with actually the groups that helped us pick the device. And there were some students that did get home and said they didn't have access. Um, now there is more, more and more Google is understanding they have to have more of an offline component. And I think it was a couple months ago, and Jamie, I'll be able to touch on this a little bit more. Um, recently, the spreadsheets became available online. For the longest time, it was just the uh, documents and presentations you can access offline, but now you can also do spreadsheets offline. Um, for the most part, the, all the documents, as long as you chain, turn on the offline option, the documents will download locally to the device, from my understanding. Uh, somehow I have messed my account up, which is of no surprise, because I mess a lot of stuff up for myself, including my personal computers. Um, but there is there's more and more functionality coming out there. As long as the students understand, you know, make sure they put those uh, PDFs and Word documents, and they, if the teacher shares something with them, they pull it down locally, make a copy on their own device. By the time they get home, they'll still have access to those. So it's a training thing with them. Obviously, without the internet, every device has a loss of functionality without that access. But hopefully, the at least the documents they want to work on, the students will have to be able, they'll be able to work on those by the time they get home. Yeah, and, and Dustin, I just want to um, jump in as well, uh, real briefly. So I was traveling uh, over the last few days and um, did a lot of the the uh, presentation I gave a couple moments ago. Those slides, a lot of that was worked on while on the um, with my Chromebook on a uh, excuse me airplane without access to the internet. So a lot of things were done offline with essentially zero loss of functionality. So and as Dustin said, more and more areas of the Chromebook and the Chromebook operating system will be able to be accessed offline in the very near future. Thank you. Uh, we have time for just one more question for each panelist. Uh, Jamie, can you search by subject or grade uh, in the Chrome Web Store as well? Uh, yeah, that functionality is going to be uh, coming very soon at, th at this exact moment. Um, it, it, we're working on it, but it's going to be something that will be available for the upcoming school year in regards to Google Play and Chrome. Uh, the Chrome Store are going to be much more aligned in the way that not only you can access different applications uh, from different devices, um, you know, especially w with uh, the tablets, some are more touch-focused uh, touch um uh, applications that will be getting to be available on Chromebooks as well as vice versa, and the search capabilities in regards to are they teacher vetted, are they state test, um, you know, checked off that this is a great thing for the state test curriculum, uh, as well as by certain grade levels, so uh, all the way down to special education. So yes, that is uh, that will be there. Okay. And uh, Dustin, last question. Um, with the 800 plus apps, can you tell us what you used and did you have to change any of them for the Chromebooks? I think I see the question you're asking. I think you're going, not, not instead of apps, it's actually access points. Um, we ended up going with uh, Cisco access points for those. Um, and I hope this is what James is asking right there. Uh, we went to Cisco. There's quite a few companies out there that have decent wireless. Just my personal opinion, try to stick to Cisco and Aruba, um, especially the larger your environment goes. You can kind of pit the two against each other and get the price down to a low cost um, at any point in time. But um, what we're going to probably do, the, the Chromebook that we went with is on uh, the 5 gigahertz wireless end. I might go in and put a WPA2 account or a network that's just the 5 gigahertz. There's a lot of interference with the 2.4, a lot more than what people think. Um, the fact that I have an access point per classroom that 5 gigahertz will be able to cover that classroom. I think it will hurt me in some of the, of the other areas throughout the campus, but I feel in, in a classroom, which is really the most important place, um, it's going to be the most beneficial to keep them on the 5 gigahertz uh, model. So I hope that answers your question. Um, also, one thing I know that was my last question, I'm going to go ahead and put at the very bottom my email address one more time. You can see there's a, quite a few questions down there. Uh, everybody that's a asking questions, do not hesitate to email me. Uh, I don't know if I'll be able to get to them today. Actually, it's not allowing me to send the question for some reason. I'm going to post my information. But again, if you wrote down my email address, um, it's just dharden, D-H-A-R-D-I-N, at newcaneyisd.org. I'll try to answer 
all the all your questions I possibly can. Terrific. And with that, uh, we will conclude today's webinar, Google for Education. I'd like to thank again uh, the panelists, Jamie and Dustin, for an excellent presentation. And thanks to the audience for joining in. As a reminder, um, please be on the lookout for a follow-up email with a copy of the slides and a link uh, to the archive of this webinar to review and share with colleagues. Thank you again so much for joining. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you.